guys, what's going on? It's Ash here coming at you today in Clash Royale. Today, we are going to go ahead and list the cards with the highest skill cap according to yours truly. You know, I want to make sure I get your guys' input, so don't forget to leave a comment after this video and tell me what card I forgot that you think has a very high skill cap. Now, before we get to the list, what is a high skill cap? What does that mean in this game? Well, basically, it's cards that require a very intimate, a very knowledgeable understanding of the game mechanics, of tile placement, of understanding every single card's aggro and their range and their distance and just how to use them properly. Some cards take more practice than others. Let's face it, guys. A telltale sign of a, a high skill cap card is usually a low use rate in a high win rate, meaning that players who know how to play those cards effectively usually win a lot with them, but because of the low use rate, not a lot of players know how to use them properly. And most of the cards will follow that rule, but not all of them on our list today. So let's just get to the list, guys. So three-way tie for number eight on the list, or six, seven, and eight, is going to be Elite Barbarians, Royal Giant, and Minion Horde. Now, these three cards are all incredibly difficult to play with success. <laughs> I got some of you. I know some of you are raging and they're like, wait, is this a joke? And he's, he's, he's still saying it. He's still going on. I should have stayed with the joke longer. But no, those would be considered probably easier cards to actually pick up and have success with, especially if they're overleveled. On the real list, it's going to be a two-way tie at seven and eight. Uh, it's going to be the two cycle cards. Now, these do not fit the rule of low use rates, but Skeletons and Ice Spirit are cards that anybody can use. But if you watch them in the, in the hands of really skilled players, they can have a ton of almost extra value for those one elixir cards. Knowing how to counter a, a minion horde with just an ice spirit. Making sure your placement is just perfect to kite troops with skeletons. You can have a lot of extra value if you play those cards correctly and you don't always just throw them uh, away, essentially cycling behind your king tower at the bridge every single time. So those cards have a lot of hidden value that you see a lot of pros uh, go ahead and capture in their matches. And it's something that we should all work uh, to just make sure that, you know, we don't throw away them. Just because they're one elixir, we actually try to use them and get value out of them. Number six on the list is going to be Dark Goblin. Now, Dark Goblin is actually a pretty strong card. Unfortunately for him, everybody compares him to the Princess, and it makes sense. Relatively long range, uh, the Princess is three elixir, he's three elixir, but they're much different, and Dark Goblin has value the Princess doesn't. Although he can't hit that Princess Tower from the bridge, he will get targeted by the Princess Tower. A lot of good players will know how to play the Dark Goblin, so they're always getting a lot of value out of him. He can take down even kind of hardier units than the Princess would be able to take care of, uh, or troops, and you, a lot of good players will play him taking advantage of the range in the opposite lane on defense. And then the opponent will have to answer in a lane that they don't want to attack to answer him or take a lot of chip damage. He fires really fast, and he's actually a really good card. Again, high uh, win rates, but pretty low use rates on the Dark Goblin. Number five is going to be Hunter. Now, I love the Hunter, but some people hate him. I think he's a polarizing card, and Hunter is very unique because both the tile placement, the angle that you place him, the angle that he'll engage the troops from, and the distance is very important. Those are two important factors, whereas you could drop an Ewiz or a Musketeer basically anywhere, as long as you know, you know, kind of try to avoid the troops coming your way or the support troops or the fireball and don't give them too much fireball damage. But the Hunter is much different. The Hunter, you, he can kill a tank easily. He can kill a giant if you place him right on top of them. He can kill a hog if you place them right on top of him. He can also kill a minion horde. He can also kill a goblin gang. So there's a lot of value he can kill an Ewas, he can kill almost everything, just depending again on the angles and the distance that you place him uh, representing to the troops coming your way. That's why the Hunter makes number five on my list of highest skill capped cards in the game. Number four is going to be one that probably none of you guys saw coming, and it's a Skeleton Barrel. Now you don't see the Skeleton Barrel too much in the meta, but a lot of players, they just kind of use the skeleton barrel and they throw it away. They don't know how to capture the value out of the skeleton barrel. And although the skeleton barrel is not the best card in the meta, surprisingly, it still has pretty healthy win rates. But good players using skeleton barrel 
just something happens where, you know, the rest of us, we play Skeleton Barrel. Sometimes we get value, sometimes we don't. Most of the times we don't. A good player will have a very, very keen awareness of the opponent's cycle at all times. And they'll know, using a variety of different cards along with the Skeleton Barrel, how to bait out the opponent's spells. A good player will actually even use a Skeleton Barrel on defense, using it against, say, an Inferno Dragon or a Mini Pekka with a Musketeer in tow. A lot of players will use the Skeleton Barrel in combination with kiting cards defensively to get a lot of value. There's actually a lot of uses to the Skeleton Barrel that aren't apparent right away. So Skeleton Barrel makes number four on the list. Number three on the list is... Wait, one second. Quick interruption, guys. Just want to inject. This is the ash from the future after I've already gone ahead and recorded this. I think I should have made this list a top ten because two cards that definitely deserve to be on the list is Tornado and Princess. No card's placement is really as valuable as Tornado's. And same thing with the Princess. When do you play her at the bridge? When do you play her behind the tower? So that's why I think that Tornado and Princess should be injected here on the list to make it a true top 10 list. So guys, go ahead and enjoy the rest of the few cards that I haven't mentioned yet. This is going to be another big rule breaker here, guys, and it is the Miner. Now again, this card has high use rates and high win rates. But the Miner is one of those cards, in my opinion, where you can capture some incredible value out of him if you take your gameplay to the next level. I'm not just talking about knowing whether to save your Miner for that Princess or save your Miner for that Elixir Pump. That's kind of like Miner 101. But you can go next level and you can redirect a Bowler or redirect a, an Executioner to the opposite direction of your troops, of your support troops. That way you can really mitigate the value there. You can even go even further next level. You saw this uh, by Pompeo and other really good players who play Miner a lot in different types of cycle decks. You can use Miner, a late Miner at that, send it in r way after the, tr the tower is already targeting your balloon or your wind condition, and then zap, retarget onto the Miner, and take that tower down, catching your opponent uh, off guard. So there's actually a lot of different ways that you can take your Miner play to incredible levels, and that's why Miner makes number th uh, three on my list here. Number two is going to be Expo. Ooh. Now, Expo has a long, in, a long story tradition of being the highest skill cap win condition in the game, and I actually buy into that. It's always had relatively low uh, win rates, but excuse me, use rates, but it's always had very healthy win rates. And I talk to a lot of good Expo players, and they all tell me the same thing, guys. They said that if a good Expo, Expo player is on their A game, meaning not making mistakes, really they should never lose a match. And that's not a clickbait title. That's just the truth. They should be able to draw or win every single match, even against golem decks or giant decks, even against hard counters, because really good expo players know how to play defensively at time and shift their play style and come away with a victory or the draw. Now, it's not just that, guys. Anybody, again, can pick up expo and have moderate success with it or even some success. But the really good players who play Expo, the guys at the very top of ladder, the guys using it in competitive CRL Asia, CRL China, and in big competitions, they know it's almost like a sixth sense. They know when to support their Expo, when to unload all of their Elixir on the Expo, and they know when to stop supporting the Expo, meaning you're not going to drop that Mega Minion, you're not going to drop that Ice Wizard, you're not going to drop those Archers, because you'll be too far behind in Elixir at that point. So that's how the really good players know how to play Expo, and because of that, Expo requires a really, really intimate understanding of your opponent's cycle and your opponent's elixir. So you have to keep track of how much elixir they have and what cards are in their hand. That's a lot to keep track of. That's why Expo makes number two on the list of highest skill cap card. What about number one, guys? This is not going to be a shocker to any of you, and it is... The Magic Archer. Magic Archer boasts incredible win rates, but whenever I do a balance change video, you guys all tell me the same thing. Where's Magic Archer? Buff Magic Archer. 
And the truth of the matter is, is a lot of pros and just good players, even non-pros who are just really good with Magic Archer, they took the time to learn the placement and, and the positioning of the Magic Archer, which is absolutely paramount to achieving value with him. Uh, people who understand that have a ton of success. As a matter of fact, a lot of pro players, a lot, have told me that Magic Archer is the best support card in the entire game. That just further proves my point that Magic Archer Archer can have a ton of value. You can, but one tile, one tile makes the difference from Magic Archer taking out all the swarm troops of the opponent and getting 400 damage because of the magic arrow going to the Princess Tower and getting absolutely no damage from the Magic Archer, getting nothing from them. So in also knowing how to use the Magic Archer in a bait deck to bait out their big spells, and then how are you going to react once they fireball your Magic Archer? Are you ready to know how to punish them given the deck that you're playing against? There's a lot of different elements and factors that go into really, really next level high tier one Magic Archer gameplay. Maybe I'll bring an episode just on the Magic Archer sometime, but for now that's going to conclude the list of the top skill uh, like skill high, high skill cap cards in Clash Royale. So guys, I hope you enjoyed the list. What cards did I forget on the list? You know, some honorable mentions, maybe Cannon Cart, maybe, oh, what else were? Cannon Cart Flying Machine were two, car two cards I considered putting in there, but truthfully, I think that Cannon Cart needs a buff and and uh, other cards like giant snowball I think it's too early to tell all right guys well, that's gonna do it for today's video make sure you let me know in the comments which cards I forgot a huge shout out to Bren Chong my YouTube partner check out his information in the description below guys thanks so much for watching and as always take care guys